So we're going to be in Romans chapter 8. You can go ahead and turn there, Romans 8, 28. Um, so lots of important announcements tonight. So appreciate um, the ladies coming out, speaking to, to us about some efforts to uh, really minister to pregnant moms um, and to save the life of babies. So uh, pray that you'll consider that so you'll be able to go um, sign up for that or just get more information afterward. And a little fun fact about uh, Christy who spoke uh, I used to work with her husband. So back when I was in the Air Force and did contractor work, um, he and I, uh, we were in the same office and we played a lot of basketball together, had some epic battles, good guy. Um, so I just appreciate you coming out. Um, and then, really important to know, next week we will be on the other side. And so if you're wondering why, because this space is great. Uh, so this church is also a school, First Baptist Academy, and their sports season is starting up. So we're gonna need to be over in the Kids Life Center um, it's a really good space, and we're actually going to be uh, doing a little remodeling to it to make it even uh, better for us. So, um, so just park in the same parking lot as always, and then um, next week we'll, we'll just go in through the door across the parking lot. So uh, remember that. Um, invite you to stay after. We're going to have an, a fun time outside doing our block party. We have a shaved ice truck and all sorts of things out there for you. So um, maybe you come tonight and you're um, not really connected to people. This is the way to connect with people. It's harder to connect if you just came here like, well, I sat through the whole Bible study and didn't really get to talk to him. Yeah, uh, there's less talking during Bible study, uh, but there's more if you hang out afterward and, and play some games with people. So I just encourage you to do that. All right, Romans chapter 8, and we're going to be in verses 28 through 30. And I'll just kind of uh, let you all know what the book of Romans has been about so far. So uh, in chapters 1 through 4 is kind of a presentation of everybody in the world as sinners in need of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and chapter 5 is, and that faith doesn't disappoint. And then chapter 6 is, um, and therefore, since you're saved by grace through faith, you ought to live like it, live like a Christian. In chapter 7, though, it's like, yeah, but we still know that in this mortal flesh, there's this sin that, that we struggle with day to day. Um, but then chapter 8 is where we're at now. And it starts off, if you look at chapter 8, verse 1, I'll have you turn there real quick. I'm going to read a few key verses. So Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says this, there is, or Therefore there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So just to make sure you're tracking with what that's saying is, if you have Jesus, then you have eternal life, is what that's saying. So this serves as kind of the thesis or the main point statement for the whole chapter. The whole chapter is about, if you have Jesus, here's why you should have confidence of salvation. And so it's a really important one for Christians because if you are a Christian, then I, I've never talked to a Christian who hasn't had doubts about their salvation. This whole chapter is about affirming your faith. And then, of course, if you're not a Christian, hearing this, that there's no condemnation for those in Christ, which means, of course, if I don't have Jesus, then there is condemnation. So that's one of the verses. Look now at verse 15 in chapter 8. Verse 15. It says, you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So this, the spirit of slavery, it's, it's making this comparison to like being in shackles. That's a life of sin, which is interesting because a lot of times people act like God's the one who, who kind of restricts us. And uh, you've heard that expression like, does God hate fun? But what this says is you don't realize that a life of sin is actually a shackle. It's actually, it's actually something that ensnares you. And, and just talk to people who have been in one specific sin for a long time. Try to quit it. Right? Try to quit that sin and, and find out how ensnared you actually are. But what we've received, if you're a Christian, is a spirit of adoption, meaning that we actually, when you come to know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, you actually get adopted into His family. You become a child of God. So again, as we're thinking in Romans 8.1, where he says there's no condemnation in Christ, well, one of the reasons why is because you become His child. Not just uh, a transfer of, okay, they're not guilty anymore. It's that too, but, but no, they're my child now, right? You're in a new family, and it's God's family. And so then Romans 8.18, it, it kind of has a, a different topic for a little bit before what we're going to talk about tonight kind of transitions back. So Romans 8.18 says this, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. So that verse is speaking to people who are like, okay, I hear you that salvation is coming. I hear you, we can trust God. That sounds great, but life right now is kind of awful, right? There's difficulties right here. And he says, I know, but hold on because eternity is better. Eternity is greater. Eternity isn't going to be worth comparing 
to this. Like this problem is nothing compared to how good eternity is going to be if you have Christ. So that's kind of what we've covered so far. And we're going to start in verse 28 in a second. Yes, yes. It's an exciting verse. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Romans 8, 28, and then 29 and 30, the three we're going to cover tonight. I'm actually going to touch on 28 tonight, and then we're going to come back to it next week. Uh, because this is such a it's such a dense topic. And here's my conviction as a preacher. As a preacher, I never want to just promote one doctrine and just like uh, we call it in uh, preacher lingo, we say it's like you're riding your pet horse. Um, like a doctrine becomes this thing that you just, you just stick to that all the time. I'm sure you've heard preachers who are like, um, they're like all in time stuff. That's all they care about. And, and maybe you're a Christian like that. That's all you want to talk about. Oh, I know that there's a lot of other books in the Bible, but give me Daniel, Ezekiel, and Revelation. And that's, that's all I need. Just give me a steady diet of that. Um, or, or whatever other doctrine it may be. So what's interesting about this passage, last week in Romans 8, I, uh, you could offend people who believe in speaking in tongues, or you could offend people who don't believe in speaking in tongues. Tonight, I could offend uh, people who are Calvinists, or I could offend people who are Arminianists. You could offend people who believe in eternal security. You could offend people who don't believe in eternal security. This section here is a landmine. I'm just saying, there is a lot of doctrine here, but what's interesting is really none of those topics are the point. Speaking in tongues isn't the point of this topic, uh, this passage. Predestination is a side point, but it's not the point of this passage. Uh, none of that really is. And so I'm going to talk about some of those topics because I know when you have the word predestination in Scripture, you got to touch on it, you got to have a, a side conversation for a little bit. But I'm also going to get you to what the main passage means. Like that should always be your goal. Never love a doctrine about God more than you love God. Never love a doctrine about Jesus more than you love Jesus. You hear people all the time that they will debate with anyone about the minutia of Scripture, and, and they'll have this, this pet little project that's like, oh, this is what I want to talk about, and I'll fight any, anybody, even a Christian. I'll go fight a Christian about this stuff, and it's like, oh, when was the last time you shared your faith? Right? Go tell someone about Jesus. I, I like digging deep. Believe me, I like digging deep. That's why next week, because um, I, I just knew with this type of topic, I'm probably going to be bombarded with questions. Save it till next week after Young Adult Night, which is going to be over there in the Kids Life Center, just right across the walkway. Um, after next week, we're going to have just an opportunity for anyone who wants to. We'll go into one of the side rooms over there. I'll have a whiteboard there. I'm going to talk through the different points of Calvinism, and I'm going to talk about the ones I agree with, the ones I don't, dis, uh, don't agree with, and give you opportunity to ask questions, get further clarification. And so I'm doing that for a few reasons. One, because I know some of you are going to have a whole lot of questions, but I also know this. That's not the main point of the passage. That doctrine is not. That's a man-made doctrine, both Calvinism and Arminianism, we're going to talk about both of those tonight, they are man-made doctrines, right? Scripture itself is not controversial. How we interpret Scripture is controversial. So they're man-made doctrines, so that, that is part of it. Um, but I also know you're going to have all sorts of questions, and I want to give you that opportunity uh, to get that. So with all of that said, we're going to start this in Romans 8.28, which is a beautiful verse. Um, mine too. Romans 8.28 says, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. So, it's a fantastic verse. It is, if Romans 8, man, it has a lot. Like I read Romans 8, 1, Romans 8, 15, Romans 8, 18, Romans 8, 28. There's going to be so many powerful verses that we read next week. They're incredible. Tonight, we're not going to cover this one as much. I'm going to save for next week. We're going to come back to it because 29 and 30 are the ones that have a little more controversy. Um, and so I'm going to just say this to it. When we read this, look at Romans 8, 28 again. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. You can imagine how Christians would use that. All things work together for good. And this is what I'm going to touch on next week. Um, if, if something tragic happened to you or a friend and someone came to you with this word, verse, we know that all things work together for good. You'd be like, really? Like this terrible thing? And, and what they would mean is, well, there's going to be a silver lining. 
right? So uh, I always use this example. I forget. I always forget the singer's name, but they they like backed over their child and killed their child with a vehicle. And I was like, man, if you go up to to someone and say that when that kind of tragedy happens, well, all things work together for good, right? Like there's a silver lining to having your child ran over. Uh, don't say that to me. Like if something happens to my kids, don't come up to me and say that. First, you're doctrinally incorrect, but then second, just don't say that to me because that's, that's a crazy thing to say to somebody. But that's not what it means. So the question we have to ask is what good? When it says we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, what good? What good is he talking about? So I'm going to point you back to this. This is the only kind of insight I'm going to give you for the, this week. And next week I'll cover it extensively. But look at 8.1 again. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. That is the continual thesis as we go through here. It is the lens through which we need to interpret this whole passage. This whole passage is, is filtered through this thing that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And therefore, when it says we know that all things work together for the good for those who love God, it's talking about eternity. It's talking about God's overall plan as we walk toward eternity that God's got a plan and it's going to work together for good. And we could see even in context why he would need to say that because he had already talked about in Romans 8.18, if you look at that, I consider the sufferings of the present time not worth comparing to the glory that is going to be revealed to us. Because they're suffering. They're going through difficulties. You all may have your own difficulties, uh, different uh, frustrations, circumstance. Maybe you're mad at God about something. Maybe something bad just happened in your life. We all have those types of things. These people are being persecuted. All right, they're going through some serious difficulties. They're also going to enter a time of persecution through the Emperor Nero that is just unheard of and unseen. And it's not going to be until um, Constantine comes to uh, Christ later, and you can debate whether it's a sincere faith or not, but either way, Christianity becomes the established religion of the Roman Empire. Not until then do Christians quit being persecuted. And so when he says, I consider the sufferings, this is a guy who knew the sufferings. Uh, a few weeks ago when I covered this, I read some of them that, man, he's been beaten with a whip, uh, had rocks thrown at him, he's been imprisoned, all that stuff. He says, I know sufferings, but I'm telling you glory is better. So when we see Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for the good, for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose, we can't misinterpret that. It's talking about eternity, and, and I'll kind of prove it to you next week. Uh, and, and I think as we go through these verses, you'll come to the same conclusion. But tonight, we're going to talk about Calvinism and Arminianism. So Jacob, go ahead and put that on the board, Calvinism. So I'm just going to read you this. You could just do a, a Google search and kind of get a definition. I'll read it and then I'll explain it. So Calvinism, also called Reformed Tradition or Reformed Protestantism, is a major branch of Protestantism that follows the theological tradition and forms of Christian practice set down by John Calvin, who lived from 1509 to 1564, and other Reformation-era theologians. It emphasizes, here's the key part to, to when you're trying to understand what does it mean. It emphasizes the sovereignty of God and the authority of the Bible. So out of the Reformation came five primary doctrines that, that really shape Protestantism, which is um, it, that word Protestant, um, came from Martin Luther when he write, wrote his 95 theses, uh, which were they were a they were grievances against the Roman Catholic Church, and so Protestant means to protest that he was going against them. So five solas they're called, or five um, alones uh, came from it. So sola scriptura, these are Latin sola fide, sola gratia, sola Christus, and sola uh, sola de gloria, which all those mean by Scripture alone, by faith alone, by grace alone, through Christ alone, glory to God alone. So if you hear all those, those are like the hallmarks of what it means to be a Protestant Christian, is those five solas. Again, you can go, uh, Google that. You can just type in the five solas, and, and you can read those. And, and I mean, you can hear them like by Scripture alone, that this is my authority. It's not tradition or other things. Scripture is the authority of my life. Um, salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast, right? So doctrines like that, come out of Calvinism um, or the, the Reformation movement, and to those, I, I totally agree. Like Those five, man, I, I think they're fantastic. Now again, next week in the class, we're going to talk about um, a little, uh, I guess, deeper. I'll give you a preview. We're going to talk about the acronym TULIP. So I'm not going to go through all that tonight, but, but there are some disagreements that I have. So 
with Calvinism, uh, the thing that we're going to cover tonight is the word predestination, right? And so predestination is a biblical word. The question is, what does it mean? What does predestination mean? So I'm going to have Olin come up in a second, and uh, we're going to do a little um, kind of, we're going to do an object lesson, lesson to help us understand this. So then the, I guess, kind of the counterpoint to Calvinism is Arminianism. So I'll just read this again to you. It says, relating to the doctrines of jo Jacobus Arminius, um, a Dutch Protestant theologian who rejected the Calvinist doctrine of predestination. So that one specifically. His teachings had a considerable influence on Methodism. The movement began early in the 17th century and asserted that God's sovereignty and man's free will are compatible. The emphasize, they emphasize free will all right, so free will or choice, for lack of a better word. So saying that you and I have a choice as opposed to predestination, that would say God chooses. Um, they emphasize free will, but they do it to a point that one could, so, so to speak, fall from grace. Right? So that's kind of a hallmark of Arminianism that would say um, you have a choice whether or not you come to Christ, but such a choice that you could say, well, Okay, I believe in Christ today, so I'm saved. I don't believe in Him tomorrow, so I'm not saved. And, and you could flip-flop back and forth. And that'll be, a, I guess, kind of a conversation for another day. That's where um, I, I certainly disagree with Arminianism, which I've made clear here in Romans 8. All right, so that was a lot of academics. And so this is why I'm teaching a different class after Y next week. Uh, that's really is into the history and things of it that I want to get. We're going to talk about the Bible of it. But I wanted to kind of give you my my personal experience with Calvinism. So most Baptists, uh, there's five points to Calvinism, not the, not the five solas that I mentioned, it's the, the acronym TULIP. Most Baptists or people of similar um, denomination are some point, they, they agree with some of the five points of Calvinism. Some agree with all, some agree with a few. Um, so when I was younger, there's this uh, guy who uh, he was a friend of mine. We played on the same basketball and baseball teams, and and so we had worked really hard uh, to to witness to him. And and there came a time where he finally gave his life to Christ. So me and my brother had prayed about him, uh, witnessed to him, and uh, he gave his life to Christ. So we were celebrating like it's really exciting time. So then this friend uh, he went to a sister youth group, uh, just one from a sister town. And uh, he went there because there was a girl there, and uh, he just wanted to go hang out with that girl. And they had a, a, um, they had a youth pastor who would be not just Calvinist, but what you'd consider hyper-Calvinist. So meaning Calvinist, but Calvinist to the extreme. Um, so the, the thought of, uh, I guess you could think of predestination, if you believe God predetermines um, all things and there is no free will, um, a hyper-Calvinist might say, yeah, he predetermines all things and I'm happy about it. And, and, uh, and, and then I'll tell you what he's going to say in a second. So his parents weren't saved, right? He, he had come to Christ, uh, but his parents still weren't Christians. And so we talked to him about witnessing to them. And he's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do that. And then, and then there came a conversation where we asked him, you know, what's, uh, you know, what's kind of that been going like sharing your faith with your parents? And he said this, he goes, what if they're not predestined? And he didn't say it in a way like, oh no, what if they're not predestined? He said it in a way like, what if they're not? And so in, in, a, in a young believer, you know, I was probably 17, 16, something like that, that just always stuck with me. And it probably unfairly represented Calvinism in my mind for a long time. Now I saw this guy later, later he's a good man of uh, Christ, and he actually said to me, he's like, yeah, after I kind of, went to Calvinistic doctrine, I probably should have been locked up for a couple years until I matured, because uh, then I would have never said something like that. Um, so, man, he's a good guy. I saw him a few weeks ago, um, gave him a hug. Good man, uh, loves Jesus. But so for a long time, that kind of, I guess, probably soured my view of Calvinism uh, and, and a little bit because of the possibility of what he said there. What if my parents aren't predestined? And so, um, I'm, I'm not saying that to sour your view. I'm saying it just to give you kind of my experience with it. And so I wanted to go ahead and have uh, Olin come up. Olin, if you would. Thanks, sir. Olin's going to be our object lesson now. Everybody give Olin a hand. Right, 
You're not, sir. But in this lesson, yeah, come on, come on. We rehearsed this, Olin. Oh, that is the only part. Olin asked me how long that he was going to be on the stage. And I was like, come on, Olin. You know I don't play any of this stuff. I just shoot from the hip. All right. So for tonight, I'm going to have him probably go back and forth a couple times. So for tonight, uh, we're going to read in a bit. It's on your paper. We're not going to read it yet. We're going to read from Matthew chapter 22. And it's a story about a king. It's in Scripture, a story about a king who hosts a banquet. So that's going to be kind of the illustration that we use tonight to talk about predestination um, and the difference, the, really the two different views between uh, Calvinism and our Arminianism. All right, so we got our king here, King Olin. We have a fancy throne chair for him. It is nice. He, brought, he had to bring it himself, though, so he's uh, not a prosperous king, I guess. Um, all right, so, so Olin is going to host a banquet later on. We're going to have that, and we're going to have um, him give invites to people. So I just wanted you to get this in your mind now, so that's all I need you for at this time. Okay. You're dismissed. You're dismissed, King. I'll call you back in a bit. I don't know how long. We'll see. <laughs> all right, so we've got Romans 8.28 in our mind, okay? So everybody, let's read it again. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. So that word called is obviously going to be significant in this. So if you think of um, called uh, or invite or summoned, anything like that, and actually in Matthew 22, what we're going to read tonight, some translations will say invited, um, but it's the same word, it's called. Um, all right, so let's go to verse 29. Everybody look at that with me. For, and that's actually not my word, it's the other word. That's not my word gar, it's those who have been coming for a while know that I like the Greek word gar because it shows up in uh, interesting places. Um, it means I say this because, but this one is hoti, which is um, a different Greek word, but it means similar thing. It's, so it's saying because. So he said, all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose, because those he foreknew, talking about God, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn, um, firstborn among many brothers and sisters. All right, so those he foreknew, he also predestined. So the question is, what does it mean to be predestined in Scripture? Right? What does that actually mean? What does it entail? And so tonight what I'm not going to be able to do is give you all the, the gradient views of predestination, and, and so part of the, part of another reason I'm going to teach that class is because some of you tonight are like, "Oh man, I came for like uh, to be pumped up about something about God or whatever," and I'm getting a seminary class here. Apologize for that. I just read a book of the Bible and go through it. Some weeks are heavier, some are not, uh, and it'll be super heavy uh, going into the Calvinist doctrine. But so, what does predestined mean? It uses this. So people who are bothered by the word predestined need to realize it is a biblical word, right? It says it right here in Romans 8.29 that those he foreknew, he also predestined. Okay, it is a biblical word. The question is, what does it mean? What, what implications does it have for us? What implications does it have for God? All right, so the Calvinistic view would say this, and Olin, let's go ahead and have you come back up. I know that wasn't very long. I could have left you there. My bad, man. So the Calvinistic view would be this. I don't. I didn't really have. Um, I didn't. I, I should have gotten invites. So you're just gonna have to do a lot of pretending tonight. Okay. You, you good with that? You're gonna do a lot of pretending. Okay. All right. All right. So the Calvinistic view would be this. So notice it says those he foreknew he also predestined. So even with that, there's some debate. Like, did God know who was gonna say yes to him? And therefore, since he knows they're gonna say yes, he only selected those. Or did God's selection come first? And therefore, it's all part of his free knowledge. Uh, I'm telling you, you can really overthink this thing. So let's just go with one basic definition of, of the Calvinistic view. So this would be King Olin. He, he knows, King Olin, um, you go ahead and get up and invite a few people to your party. But in his foreknowledge, in his foreknowledge, he knows who, who will say yes. So let's say we got a room filled with people here, and there are some who God, knowing all things, knowing the entire future, he knows. He knows exactly what you're going to say because he's God, right? He knows what you're going to say. Therefore, he's only going to select a few. So 
Um, anytime today. Thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, it doesn't have to be a belabored thing. There we go. Oh, is your brother here? Is your brother here? Because that'd be fun. Okay. Just pick one of them. That'd be funny. <laughs> just pick like, did, you, did he pick you or did you just come up? You snuck into heaven. <laughs> All right, that's good. All right, so, so here's the thing. With this view in mind, with this view in mind, none of you got an invite, right? God in His foreknowledge, because He foreknew, because He foreknew, He also predestined. Okay? So this is one view of it. All right, you guys can go ahead and sit down. Oh, and you can stay there. I won't make you go sit back down. You just, you're just probably going to spend a lot of time up here with me today, so get comfortable. I asked him beforehand. Sometimes I just ask for random volunteers and they have no idea what they're getting into and then I feel bad later. Um, all right, so that's one view of it. So then there's an alternative view. Before, before we do that, I want, to read some, um, I want to read some passages so that we can get uh, more into our mind of this. So look at your papers there. You have Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 through 5. Now what's interesting is, as you read through Scripture, the wording of some verses favor Calvinism. The wording of some verses favor Arminianism. If it were simple, people would quit arguing and it'd be done and be like, oh, no, it's clear. Like, there's a, there's a clear outline. All right. So what's interesting is verse 29 here. What I'm going to show you in a second, I actually think it favors Arminianism. Verse 30, I think, favors Calvinism. All right. So, but those he foreknew, he also predestined. So look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 through 5. It says, For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless in love before, uh, before Him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. So there's that word again, predestined. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for Himself according to the good will of His pleasure. So predestined to be adopted. So I won't make you get up and do it again, but just now, just change the language, no longer a banquet, but now adoption. So he went and picked like four people, you're adopted, no one else had a chance to be adopted. That's the view. All right, now let's go to Ephesians 1. And I'm going to go through these verses again and explain how an Arminian would uh, interpret them. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 through 14 says this, In him we have also received an inheritance because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of His will, so that we who had already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to His glory. In Him you were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of His glory. So again, you see that predestined again. We were predestined according to His plan. So you can see really easy if you subscribe to Calvinistic theology. Um, one of the things that, especially as you go through academics, one of the things you have to do is decide whether an argument is rational or not. It is a rational argument to conclude that predestined means he picks some people, he doesn't pick others. We're going to go through this again in Romans chapter 9. It's a rational argument to conclude that, but there's a counterpoint. So the counterpoint, I actually, uh, this is one area where I do disagree with Calvinism. So I'm going to take you back to Romans chapter 8 verse 29 again, and I want to point this out to you. It says, for those he foreknew, he also predestined. Now, if I stop there, Calvinist someone who subscribes to that theology, certainly right. But he doesn't stop there. He says, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. All right, you hear that? There's a distinction in what is predestined. So in the first thing that I had Olin do, if I'm representing the Calvinistic view, the first thing I had him do was just go pick a few people. Because if I stop, I say, for those he foreknew, he also predestined. So I know who's coming, so I predetermine them. But that's not actually what the verse says. It says, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So here's the distinction. An Arminian, and this is where I would agree with them, though I have disagreements, plenty of them with an Arminian doctrine, where I would agree with them is that it is not the person, but the destiny that is predestined. So here's what I mean by that. Not the person, but the destiny. All right, so now we got Olin here. Go ahead, King Olin. Yeah. Olin, go ahead and get up again for me, please, sir. 
All right, now let's pretend that I was a better planner and I had given all sorts of like things to you to help you uh, do this charade and you had like pockets full of invites and you just scattered them to everybody. All right, so in this, let's pretend that King Olin, go ahead and pretend you're like throwing an invite. There you go. All right, everybody got the invite. How about that? How about that? And that is on camera? So <laughs> Jacob, Jacob, make some sort of meme with that. Uh, is it GIF or JIF? No, let's know. Calvinism Arminian is enough of a debate tonight. We're not doing that one. All right, so he gave every single one of you an invite, okay? All right, you can sit back on your throne. You're liking this a little too much. Um, so, so he gave everyone an invite, and so here would be the alternative view. Now, God does have foreknowledge. No one should debate that, right? If you, do, if you debate that, then who you believe in is apparently not God. God knows all things. In fact, sometimes I think we simplify God's thinking because we put him on a linear thing. Uh, we act like there's a timeline and God just knows the alternate, alternate end. I think God's uh, omniscience is what it's called. He's all-knowing. I actually think it's far more complex than that. I think God knows the outcome of every decision that has ever been made or uh, ever has not been made. And every ramification, every choice tree that's come from every, every single instance when you choose something, if you wake up in the morning, should I wear a red shirt? Should I wear a blue shirt? And you pick one. I think God knows the end of what happened if you wore the other color, right? I think God, when we think of omniscience, I think it's more than just, oh, there's this line here and God's sees the end of it. I think it's God in his, in his majesty and magnitude. He understands all things. Okay, but so God, or Olin, playing God, distributed, yeah, he's just the king. <laughs> Not the king of kings, just the king. So he distributed invites to all people, right? But in his foreknowledge, he knows who is going to say yes, right? So we had those individuals say yes, all right? So individuals who he chose, go ahead and come back up to stage, if you will, please. Go ahead, come on. Expeditiously. Expeditiously. All right, there we go. All right, so the king then, knowing that these were going to say yes, that you were going to say no, he prepares a future for them. He prepares a place. So if this is the king and he's throwing a banquet and he says, I send out all sorts of invites, what I want to do is I want to prepare a place for all the ones who RSVP. So how do I RSVP? I trust Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. And because I've done that, he says, just like in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. Right? So that's what he does. And if you look at the verse, everybody look at Romans 8, 29 again. For those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So what he did, he didn't say, in my understanding of this verse, he didn't say, I predestined, I'll pick that one, that one, that one, the rest of you, sorry. Uh, I know the Bible says God is love, but too bad. Um, I'm also a God of wrath. You all have read that too. That's in the Bible. Um, so too bad. I don't think that's what it's saying. I think it's saying, I know who's coming. And so anyone who comes to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I have a destiny for you. I have predetermined a place. If you come to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there is a glorious future waiting for you. A, a future where, if you look at Romans 29 again, where you will be conformed to the image of His Son so that He would be the firstborn among many, many brothers and sisters. So that's how I view predestination. All right, thank you all. Y'all can go sit down. Olin, you can go for a little bit. I don't know how long. You can stay there. For, no, go ahead. Go back. Go ahead. Shooting from the hips fun. So now let's look at Ephesians 1 again. So now if you read these verses with an Arminian lens. For He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Again, it's logical to see that as He picked me, not you. But again, you see the next word, to be holy and blameless in love before them. He predestined us to be adopted as sons. So again, you could say, well, He picked you or you and not you or you. Or you could say, no, the destiny of those who come to Christ, the destiny is to be adopted that adoption is part of the future. So, adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. Alright, so then look at Romans, or I mean Ephesians 1, verse 11 through 14. In Him, we have also received an inheritance because we are predestined, so again, it's logical to say He's talking about us, according to the plan. So then if you're an Arminian, you view this as, or I say if you are an Arminian, I don't, Let's not always label ourselves. How about that? I'm going to say that kind of language so that we can uh, make clear distinctions. But again, I'm neither. I'm neither Calvinist nor Arminian. Um, 
I prefer to be a Christian, and I like, uh, I like Christianity. And then if a doctrine is helpful, great. And if parts of it are helpful, great. Uh, if parts are not helpful, I, I don't use them. All right, so it says uh, Ephesians 1.11. In him we, were also, we also received an inheritance because we were predestined. So again, it could be Calvinistic. According to the plan. So what you can see is the whole plan is the thing that is predetermined. Of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will. So in this destiny, in this predetermining act, he's planning all things. Verse 12, here, here's what an Arminian would point to. So that we who had already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to his glory. Right? You hear that? We who had already put our hope in Christ. We who have come to Christ, that's who it's talking to. Verse 13, In Him you were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. Now, Calvinists would say uh, to this that you were only able to believe because Christ Jesus, uh, or because God opened your heart to this. But I would say that this belief here came before. So verse uh, 14 and on, it talks about the down payment of the Holy Spirit. So again, that talks about eternity. All right, and then I just listed 1 Corinthians 2.7 because it again, um, it again speaks of the word predestined. I, I looked up all the verses that have something to do with the future and used that word predestined. Uh, that one's not as relevant though. So, so here's the question. When we talk about predestination, if I read Romans chapter 8, verse 29, if you're new here and you're like, Holy moly, this is heavy. I apologize, it's not always like this. But also, I'm always happy to dig into God's Word, right? God's Word is good, this is the Word of truth, and I promise you, we are going to get to the point of the message. We're going to get to the point of the passage tonight. So Romans 8.29, look at that with me. For those He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. You can see how both interpretations work. You really can you can see that um, those who believe that God picks certain individuals and, and dismisses others, you can see how that works. So what we're going to talk about tonight is one reason I believe He doesn't do that, um, and, and you're going to see uh, a lot of Scripture in a second. He could mean that. Or what, what is predetermined, what is predestined, you could see it the other way, that it's a destiny. It's not the people invited to the party that are predetermined. He sent out invites to all, is my belief. And then he knows because he's God, he knows who's going to come, and therefore he prepares a place for them. All right, so I'm sure there's lots of questions. Save those for next week. Uh, now let's look at verse 30. So Romans chapter 8, verse 30. So I think the first verse, verse 29, favors Arminians. I think verse 30 favors Calvinists, in my opinion. And those he predestined... He also called. And those He called, He also justified. And those He justified, He also glorified. So the last two, the justified and glorified, we're not going to deal with those as much. Uh, I'll just explain them real quick. Justified means to be declared not guilty. Glorified is that future state that our bodies will be in once, once uh, God uh, res restores us to what we should have been if we had not sinned. So justified and glorified, those are talking about future things. They're going to be important. I'll talk about them in a second. But what's the controversial part is it says, and those he predestined, he also called. So here's one that if you're a Calvinist, it's like, like that's a slam dunk verse. I mean, it's one that you're like, look, those he predestined, he called. You'd be like, so, so who does he call? The ones he predestined. If, if we're talking about what called means, it means I invite. It means I summon you to come to me. It means that out of all the people in the world, the ones who have the destiny, I'm calling you. I'm calling specifically you. So here's the question that we have to ask, right? Does it mean that's, a, that's all he calls? Does that, is that it? Does he only call people who are predestined? Or does he call everyone? Is he the king when Olin's sitting in the chair that he goes out and he calls all sorts of people? Or is he the king that goes out and says, you, you, and you, and that's it? All right. So that's the question we want to answer with Scripture. So now, uh, Olin, let's go ahead and do one more. One more. So I'm going to read this, Matthew 22. Everybody can follow along. It's on your sheet. Yeah, you can go ahead. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to just kind of act it out as I go. 
Except for there's one part where uh, he kills people. Don't do that. You don't even have to act that one. You just, yeah. You can do this or, I don't know. what. Ad lib, but within reason. All right, so Matthew 22, verse 1. Look at it with me. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. Hey, right there. Son. <laughs> Who'd you call son, just for the record? Was it imaginary person or? It's Mariana. It's Mariana, okay. <laughs> he sent his servants to summon those invited to the banquet, but they didn't want to come. How you, did you act that out? Sort of. I did like a, and then no. Do this, like... <laughs> It's not even worth my time. Just go, go. All right. Again, he sent out other servants and said, tell those who are invited, see, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding. That's true. So you're just watching them. Come to the wedding banquet. All right, verse five. Look at it with me. But they paid no attention and went away, one to his own farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged and sent out his troops, killed those murderers, and burned down their city. <laughs> That's good. That's good. All right, so hear this. Hear that. that was really good. That actually had a sound effect. That was impressive. So, so, so far what has happened is the king has sent the invite to everyone, right? And this story starts off, the kingdom of heaven is like this. So the king sends out his servants, and it is fair to say in Scripture, the prophets and Christ himself have been killed by people. All right, so look at verse 8 now. Then he told his servants, the banquet is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Now, why were they not worthy? Because they didn't accept his invitation, right? That, that was the thing they would have had to do to be worthy. Verse 9, go then to where the road... Roads exit the city and invite everyone you find to the banquet. So those servants went out on the roads and gathered everyone. They found both good and evil, or evil and good. The wedding banquet was filled with guests. When the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed for a wedding. So he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him up, hand and foot, and throw him into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now I'm going to pause there for a second. So that sounds harsh, right? It's an analogy. God's not saying, look, if you come with the wrong clothes to heaven, uh, outer darkness. What he is saying is, the clothes, the garment, is Jesus. It's robes of white because you've been washed by the blood of the Lamb. Right? That, that is the thing that we need to wear to heaven is the blood of Jesus Christ. We need to have accepted the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, this says outer darkness, cast out, that, that you're not dressed appropriately for heaven. In fact, numerous times in Scripture, it says flesh and blood won't inherit the kingdom of heaven. What that means is it's not talking about just your skin and stuff. It's talking about your worldliness. Your worldliness our sin is not welcome in heaven, and it has to be through Christ. We have to be, it's, a, it's symbolism, but clothed in Him and His sacrifice. So then it says, look at verse 14 on that. For many are invited, it's the same word as called, but few are chosen. So we see it there, that many are called, but few are chosen. That word chosen is, is a catch word in this topic too. It means elect, just like the Jewish people were the elect of the Old Testament. The Christians are the elect of the New Testament. And I'll point this out, that the Jews were never supposed to be the only ones to know God. They were supposed to be a light into the world too. That's in the Old Testament. Christians, you're elect, not just for your own, um, oh, look at me and how good I am. I'm elect so that I can, I'm chosen. Uh, I, I'm his special and peculiar people, as Scripture calls us, so that I can go out and tell the world about him. That's what I'm supposed to do. So when we hear that chosen, it makes it sound like it's some snobby club that God picks some people and not others. And I don't believe at all that's what it's meant to be. It means that who are my people in this world? It's Christians. And so the question is, how are Christians predetermined? Is it the king that he sent an invite to just a few because he knew who would say yes? Or is it a king who says, I send it to all and some respond? Matthew 22 makes me believe that many are invited. I think all are invited, 
but not everybody responds. So then we see Revelation. Uh, I'm going to read through some of these. I'm just going to read these quickly. Olin, thank you. You can go ahead, sir. Good job. Everybody give him a hand. That's the last one. You can leave it there. You can leave it there. Yeah. It's good. It's good. I may get tired once I sit down. So. All right. Revelation 3.20. See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. I want to emphasize that I don't remember if I bolded yours or not. Did I bold yours? The word anyone, that's me doing it, not scripture. All right. Is anyone bolded in yours? I bolded it in mine. Sorry about that. I should have. Anyone. I believe it calls anyone. Look at Matthew 7, 8. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be open. You see that? Everyone. If you seek, if you are here tonight and you're seeking God, if you're truly seeking God, God says you can find Him. He is not far from you, as Peter says in a different place. He is not far from you. If you're seeking God, you can find Him. 2 Peter 3, nine. look at this one. The Lord does not delay His promise, as some understand delay. So this is talking about, uh, this whole section is interesting. It's about the, the end of times and when there will be a melting away and a new heaven and a new earth. Um, and it says, well, why is God delaying? What are we waiting for? It's like Romans here when it says, um, that waiting for the end, that all creation is groaning. What are we waiting for? God, he says here, I'm, I'm not slacking my promise. I'm not delaying my promise. But look at the middle part of that verse. But is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Here's what I believe about the God of heaven. I believe he wants every single soul to be saved. Now, something I've heard in this conversation uh, between Calvinists and Arminians is that God has still brought glory even when someone is destroyed in, in a real place called hell and eternal fire. And, and true, like true, God, God is just and right because we're all sinners, but he doesn't want to. I'm telling you, it's scriptural that God doesn't want to. And here's one issue that I've always had with this notion of God calling people and they have no choice um, but to respond, this, it's one of the doctrines, it's called irresistible grace. A problem I've always had with that is, in Scripture 1, we do see times where, where God's grace has been resisted. In fact, if you look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament is a picture of people resisting God. Like, read the Old, Old Testament sometimes, it's God's people are doing good and they have a good king and, and, and things are great and then they rebel against Him. I'm telling you, if God, if His grace is irresistible, and, and to clarify, it could be. Scripture says He could make the rock speak. God can make whatever He wants happen. I 100% agree with the sovereignty of God that He is in control of all things. But I think He's so in control that He's allowed freedom. Allowed it. Not that it's just a thing that we have to have, but I think He has allowed it. And so here's the thing with irresistible grace. If God could just tap on a few people like Olin did tonight, just, and everyone has to respond yes. If that's the case, if every heart that God touches on has to respond yes, then a God of love would tap on every heart. I believe that. I believe that with all my heart. I believe what Scripture says here, 2 Peter 3, 9, read it with me again. The Lord does not delay His promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Ezekiel 33, 11 says the same thing. Tell them, as I live, this is the declaration of the Lord God. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked person should turn from his way and live. Repent, repent of your evil ways. Why will you die, house of Israel? That's him obviously talking to Israel, who were his chosen at the time. And God is saying, I take no pleasure in the death of a wicked person. I want you to repent. And I'm saying if God... It has this thing where he's just going to touch on certain hearts and those hearts have to respond to him, then a statement like this is kind of empty. It is. If God is the one who makes people turn to him and he's sitting here screaming to people, I take no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked, but that you would turn, repent, repent, and you say, I can't until you touch my heart, God. Like until you make your grace touch me, I can't turn to you. So why are you screaming that to me? I'm just trying to think logical here. John 3.16. This is one we gloss over. For God loved the world. That's, the Greek word is cosmos. That's a pretty big picture, right? That's not a few minute people. people. For God so loved the world in this way, He gave His one and only Son so that everyone, 
who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Hear me emphasize that, everyone. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Hear that word, the world, three times. Right? Not just, not just pick and choose four people from a room filled of people, but he wants the whole world to be saved. I believe God in heaven sent his son to die on the cross, not just for a few people, but for all. But we have a part to play in it. We have to turn to Him. We have to surrender to Him. We have to accept His free gift. Romans 10, which we're going to get to in a little bit, uh, in a few weeks, maybe a few months, we'll see. <laughs> if you, I bold in that in mind, I apologize, it should have been bold in yours. If you have a pen, underline that. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Here's what I want to say to you as we eventually go into Romans chapter 9 and on. It's all about, it's all about why hasn't Israel come to Christ? And even in the midst of this picture of why hasn't Israel come to Christ, individual salvation was still possible. Individual salvation here, that if any person, whether it be Jew, Gentile, whoever, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Individual salvation. So look at verse 10. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. For the Scripture says, everyone who believes on Him will not be put to shame. Since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call upon Him. Listen to verse 13. This, this for me, seals it for me, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, will be saved. When I think about the difference between these two doctrines, Calvinism, Arminianism, this is where I side with the Arminians, someone who would believe this doctrine. I think God has extended an invite. I think He is a king who is on the throne, absolutely sovereign over all things, but He has sent an invite out to all people. And the thing He has not predetermined is who will respond. The thing I believe that He has predetermined is, since He knows who will respond, he says in John 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's what God's saying is that I've prepared a place for every single person who is RSVP'd to heaven, and you RSVP to heaven by accepting Jesus Christ. That's the thing predetermined, not the individual. It's not, it's not God, in my opinion my opinion in Scripture and all those verses that we just read through that say anyone, everyone, all those things, the cosmos that God has offered to every single person in this room, every single person in the world, every single person who has ever existed and every single person who will ever exist, He has offered the gospel to, to every person. And He says, I know that you are a sinner, but my son died for you. And if it were a God who just selects certain people, He wouldn't need to tell all of us that. But He's told the whole world. He's given us this message and said, spread this message to the whole world. The invite is out there. This invitation, the gospel message found in these scriptures that can make you uh, wise unto salvation, this is offered to you, to all people, to everyone. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. I think that's the heart of it. So here, going back now to Romans chapter 8, this was an entirely, we'll call it a parenthetical lesson. You, you understand what that means? A parenthesis. Like, there's a whole sentence going on and then there's a parenthesis. That's what this lesson was. I had to talk about predestination. All your questions I'll try to answer next week. We'll go through the whole doctrine of Calvinism. I'll talk about TULIP. I'll, I'll say the things that I, I agree, the things that, and if you don't understand what I mean about TULIP, it's an acrostic that represents their doctrines. I'll explain uh, all that, um, and you can ask me questions. Feel free to disagree with me as long as you love Jesus. I won't care. Um, I have family members who I think are wonderful uh, brothers, sisters in Christ that lean far heavier toward Calvinism than I do. Love them. I've got one who is one of the best evangelists I've ever seen. So uh, here's what I wouldn't want you to do after leaving tonight is join the fight between Calvinism and Arminianism. That'd be the worst thing you could do. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to understand some things. 
Like, hopefully you've learned some things. If nothing else, you have some verses. Go home, pray about those things. But here's what I want you to do before we leave. I want you to understand this in context. Why did Paul talk about this? Have you asked yourself this whole time, why did he say any of this stuff? I want to read Romans 8, 28 again, 29 and 30. And I'm going to talk to you for a second about why. Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. He's telling them that we know that things work out for good. Why is he telling them that? Because right now things are bad. Right, right now things are difficult. They're going through some stuff, persecution, families being ripped apart. Maybe they're going to have to go to the Roman Colosseum and, and battle for their life. Things are difficult. Maybe they're like some of the apostles, some of the disciples who, who are going to be crucified, beheaded, boiled in oil. Right? Maybe, the, maybe that stuff's going on. And he had just said, I consider that the sufferings of this present time aren't worth comparing to the glory that is going to be revealed in us. And if you're someone who gave your life to Christ and all of a sudden your world is harder, it's more difficult. Like I was good. I was just considered Jewish or a Gentile and it was an accepted religion of the time and it didn't violate the peace of Rome. Is one of the things with Rome. It's called the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, that you, couldn't, uh, you could believe in whatever faith you were, but there couldn't be a new faith. There couldn't be a new thing. So what if you're a Jew or a Gentile and you had all these beliefs and life was good and now I came to Christ and life is hard. Life is more difficult. And maybe you're like that. Maybe um, you had all sorts of friends and they didn't make fun of you and it wasn't awkward around them and, and now it is because of Christ. And he's saying, but heaven is better in, in Romans 8.18. And you say, okay, but man, how can we be certain? You see the title that I put on your message tonight? This is what it actually is. He's saying you're in his hands. Like no matter tonight, whether you lean toward the Calvinistic side or the Arminian understanding of these verses, the point of the passage is clear. Salvation is in his hands. It's not in yours. So you may be worried about, man, this world seems very difficult. Like so many uncertain things. Um, maybe you have relationship troubles, maybe you have uh, job troubles, school troubles, uh, family troubles, maybe you got all, all that kind of stuff and the world seems unstable and you're like, there's one thing out there you're saying to trust in God. I can't trust in anything. Why could I trust in God? Uh, how can I know that this eternity is secure? How can I know that it's going to work out? And he says, we know that all things work to good for those who love God. And you say, good? Do you know how bad my life is? And that's when I say, yeah, let's read this in context. It's about eternity. We know that God's redemptive plan is working out. And we know it's working out and, and all things are working toward this culmination of salvation, the salvation of your soul, the restoration of all, all things that he's ever created, the, the, the wiping out of the old and the creation of the new, the new heaven and the new earth. All this is going to happen according to God's redemptive plan and it has nothing to do with your ability. It has nothing to do with whether or not you can hold on to this salvation. Salvation is in his hands. We know that all things are working to good for those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. And then he goes on, verse 29, Hoti, because those He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. You hear that? Man, it's bad here on earth. It's difficult. Life is hard. Bad things happen. How can I trust this salvation? He says, because, in my view, the destiny is predetermined. Heaven is predetermined. God has already set it up. He knows that You've accepted Christ. He knows that people in the future will accept Christ and He has prepared a place for them and that's all in His hands and it has nothing to do with you. He's saying so you can rest in that. And then He goes on, and those He predestined, He also called. And those He called, He also justified. And those He justified, He also glorified. And you say, okay, now we're getting back into doctrine. No, that's not what He's doing. He's saying, do you hear all those things that God did? It was never about your ability to come to Him. It was never about your ability to be good enough or, or correct yourself enough to say, now I'm finally worthy. Now I've finally done enough. Now I've No, salvation's always about Him. No matter which side you, you stand on, the Arminian, the, the uh, Calvinistic side, no matter which side, salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ is always the message of the Bible. He says that you feel like sometimes things are about you. He says, 
Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, glorified. You hear that, that God is the one who predetermines. God is the one who invites. God is the one who declares not guilty. God is the one who will one day bring you up in glory, resurrect you in glory, get rid of the old sinful body and make you anew. It's all about God. That's what I want you to hear tonight. We had an interesting side tangent about Calvinism versus Arminianism. We're going to have more of those because Romans 8, 9, and 10 are so contentious. But I'm saying the message of this passage is not contentious because it's supposed to be a comfort to people in pain. It's supposed to let you know that your salvation is in His hands, not your own. And I'm telling you, that's not a contentious message. I am glad that my future is predetermined. I am glad that even though this, this life is very um, unpredictable, right? Man, has the last year been unpredictable? It's a crazy world. It is. But there's a God who speaks universes into existence. A God who is that magnificent, grand, and yet right now you only breathe because of Him, that same God. Right now, every, every time your heart beats, every single time, it's only because of Him. Right now, He knows the number of hairs on your head. Right, That God who is that big and that small, it's all about Him. I am glad that, that there is a God who, who is so great and yet so personal that He would die to save me. That's the picture here, and it's not controversial. Unless someone hates God or hates Jesus, it's not controversial to say that there is a God who loves you so much that He set up a future for you. Let's pray. Father God, I'm grateful that there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Guys, the band comes, and we get ready to have a time where maybe someone uh, has some things to pray about. Um, God, I pray that we would take rest in You I pray that tonight is, was okay by you, that it's what you wanted. I have trouble detracting from the actual message, but sometimes I think we have to take sidetracks. And so, God, I pray that maybe, maybe there is less confusion now than there was before. I pray not more. But I pray we can have those talks um, and clarify things for people as they have questions. But, God, my, my sincere prayer is this tonight that every single person here would not love doctrine more than you. We would love doctrine because of you, though, because we want to know you, and we want to know how to please you, but that we wouldn't just get some systematic theology that we, uh, we label ourselves with, and, and therefore we cling to that, and we, know, we, we may be more subscribed to Calvin than we are to Christ, or Arminius than we are to Christ. Let it not be so, because Christ is not divided. You, God, are a good God, and you give us your word, and some of the things are complex. Peter even says about the Apostle Paul, many of which things are hard to be understood. It is. This is hard to understand. How free will and predestination work together, we don't always get it. Sometimes we think we get it. Sometimes we think we get it a little too much. What I do get, though, is what you said in your word here tonight, that I'm in your hands, that every heart, every soul here is in your hands. And I believe you're calling every single person to surrender to you. And so maybe tonight there is a person who maybe they didn't need this academic lecture, but what they needed was to know that there's a God who loves them. And to know that there's a God who not only loves them, but is a great God who, who does declare the end from the beginning. And so if their life feels unstable, they can know that there's a place of ultimate stability, a great foundation. And no other foundation can be laid than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. And so God, I pray that tonight, if there's a person who is standing on sifting sand, an unstable rock, an unstable foundation, because they base their life on their own skill or ability or hopes or passions or ambitions or desires. And they've found again and again that it doesn't satisfy. Then God, I would pray that they would surrender to you, the one who satisfies the soul and saves the soul. The God who says to hurting people, 
I've got this. You're in my hands. God, I pray that that give peace to the Christian tonight, and I pray it be the introduction to peace to a non-Christian tonight. I invite them to talk to me afterward or one of our leaders and ask how they can be saved. And I pray for we Christians in this room that we not be divisive, but we be peacemakers. Because after all, we have the gospel of peace. Not the gospel that Christians should hit each other over the head with, but the gospel that should change the world and bring salvation to all who hear it if they surrender to you. Praise you for this time and for this group. I pray that we have a good time of fellowship afterward. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.